is our great security team. The process that they're doing is checking everybody's identification before they come in. experience has been like so far and can you tell us a little bit about how it's been to handle traffic and bring people in? Well, uh, we've had uh, the exhibitors come in, uh, been very cooperative with us. We have an excellent security here. We just want to make sure the right people come in and the correct setup is made. We don't have a lot of space in the tarmac this year, as you know. We have a lot more exhibits in, in static, uh, uh, static uh, exhibits. And so what we're doing is getting people in and out and uh, Making it able for people to work. So safety is job one here. Safety job one. Fantastic. How's your experience been with Yuri's night so far? This is my second year. Second year. And what? This is kind of we're well organized. Tell us a little bit about your experience. Come on up. And, and both of you, come on up. This is Lima. This is Lima 2 3. No, I'm Lima 2. This is Lima 3. Yeah. Our experience with this one is the same as last year. As logistics, we're always uh, supporting. We're here until about uh, 10, 11 o'clock last night. Can you tell me what your positions are at NASA Games Research Center? Okay. This is the supply manager, Mr. Mr. Chaplin. Uh, sir, just no, that's fine, just park in front of that. My name's Eric Tristich. I'm the Deputy Division Chief for the Logistics and Documentation Division. And we're just having fun supporting this event. Uh, it's a lot organized this year. The only thing is that we are logisticians uh, and also somewhat security slash parking lot attendants. So. 
What's it like to work with all these artists and performers to see this integration of the arts and sciences happening? Do you have any observations from working so closely with scientists? What it's like now to try to weave these two cult different cultures together? Very interesting to me. <laughs> Very interesting. And uh, I think it's the future of the NASA. Yeah, it is interesting watching everybody come in. It, what it is is unique seeing a flat come together. So that's the, that's the uh, positive thing about it. Yes. Watching it all come together and uh, we're hoping everything works out. We did this last year, we can do it this year, no problem.
Uh, this is Chris um, from Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, I'm just excited to be here today seeing everybody set up. Um, I'm working on the VIP area and sponsorship, so just keeping our lovely supporters happy and making sure everybody has a good time and that the event goes ahead. So I'm just really excited to be here and I wanted to come last year and I'm sorry I missed it this year. I get a chance to be around the middle of it, so it's great. What's it been like for you to work with the team and to see the concepts and the discussions going on and now watch it come to fruition? I'm just amazed how, how calm and relaxed everybody is. I mean, it's just <laughs> amazing. I mean, I heard last year was such a panic, but this year it's like everybody's asleep. I mean, and I'm feeling at this point uh, pretty enthusiastic about the event. See, to me, this, this event is really a lot about community. Um, and for the team of people that put it together, uh, there's probably about uh, 40 of us who are volunteers and then an equal number of people on the NASA side who worked really hard to put this event together. Uh, there's an incredible sense of uh, camaraderie, and uh, you know we're really you know, feeling pretty good about, about the whole event at this point. Uh, one other great thing is that as I've walked around the NASA Ames, uh, people who are at the center who are coming to and I have this incredible sense of excitement, uh, which is really amazing to me. Even though this is only the second year we've been doing Yuri's Night, people talk about Yuri's Night as if it's been going on for years and years, and there's a sense of anticipation in the air. Uh, it's healthy for this community, and I'm very glad to be putting it on. I, to me, I think that an important transition is happening in our society broadly, but here at NASA specifically, and I'm, I'm actually pretty happy that NASA is kind of on the forefront of that transition. I think that the arts uh, are a tremendously important part of the human experience, and as are the sciences for that matter, and our, our culture is, is tremendously scientific and analytical, uh, you know, technological. Uh, we've, we've gotten a lot of mileage from that in the, you know, in the recent century, uh, but I think that people are realizing that they need something to balance that out, some, some artistic balance, uh, you know, some celebration uh, to remind them of why they do it in the first place. I think that the people high up within NASA are wise to that, and they, they know that in order to inspire the current generation, which is really fixated and focused on that kind of uh, breadth of experience, they need to, to cater to that, and so I'm very happy they're doing that, they seem to really realize it, and uh, you know, I'm happy to be part of it. Morning, Frank. How are you doing this morning? I feel great. I'm looking forward to a fantastic event. Yeah, I think it's going to be a really good one this year, and it's like a lot of things. Um, it just gets better every year. Uh, we uh, still uh, probably not where we want to be right this second, just as far as getting all the exhibitors up. But uh, layouts worked out pretty good, and uh, you know, we're ready to rock and roll today. And what's your role in all of this? Yeah. Um, if you were a baseball player, uh, I, I'm basically a utility player. I have my normal position that I play, and then I fill four, five, six other positions when a problem comes up. And so, 
um, there are benefits. So I'm a problem solver, I guess. And the benefits to NASA to bring these communities together. Do you have any observations oh, about sure. that? I mean, uh, you know, just selfishly for a second. Excuse me, just a second. Selfishly for a second, you know, I'm. I grew up during Walter Cronkite and the initial space things, but I'm in my mid 50s. And that's the whole issue right now is that there's just a lot of folks in that 19 to 35 range period that don't really have that um, uh, commitment to, to space exploration that maybe, you know, like you and I did where we grew up. And like everything else nowadays, you just have to do things differently to to get where you want to go destination wise and i know it's uh hey yeah you know it's a certainly uh building and flying stuff it's different but if this is the approach that we have to take you know that's indians need it because uh, we're all going to be 70 one of these years and we need to have some people who are going to be in their uh, 30s 40s and 50s that can kind of take all of our place i worked on swarm and what's swarm tell us about swarm i think the tagline is it's a uh, semi-autonomous fleet of spherical robots. My name is Kate McGonigal. I am working on the Tech Expo this year and I am so excited and happy to be here and involved with Yuri's Night. It's actually my first time at the event. It's been beautiful just to see it start from scratch and kind of build up and to finally be here is just a great feeling. So thank you everyone. So Lindy, you've been busy these past couple weeks. Tell us, what have you been busy with? We have been answering questions. Come over questions. this way. The, the, uh, <laughs> answering questions about what? It's been nothing to do. We've been, haven't we been bored, stiff, nothing to do? To be honest. 
And uh, tell us what your role in this was. She's told us what her role is. <laughs> My role was filling. You know what the most fun thing I did was in running Facebook ads? I'm not sure how well they worked, but it's real-time social data. You, you, you try a little ad out and you say, I only want to target females. And then you see how many of them click. And you say, I only want to target males. And you see how many of them click. Males click on our ads more than females do. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. That's fantastic yeah. market research. It was now, what's your anticipation for the evening? What, how do you feel in terms of, of seeing all this come together and knowing what the magic that this space is going to create I'm for thousands of people about tonight? People who come for one thing, see something they weren't intending to see, and yeah. being having their minds expanded by that. I work on Swarm. And what's Swarm? Tell us about Swarm. I think the tagline is it's a uh, semi-autonomous fleet of spherical robots. Um, and what's your anticipation for the evening? I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Be a lot of fun. Have you worked a project like this before in a space like this? I worked here last year I'm at, at uh, Net. And what was that like for you? It was fun, a lot of fun. It's, it's really uh, really cool being in a creative space like this with all uh, you know, the technology they have going on. And that's what gives us the idea to make what we see as you know, rockets. And we've been uh, contacting uh, artists all over the world and flying them in and making sure all their needs are taken care of and getting them set up and working together. It's amazing thousand people jigsaw puzzle, which is fit together so well. They're supposed to get them. Oh, there he is. I'm just for it.
Next. 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 Fine. Fine. Next. We're good. Is there anything you want to say about your participation and experience at Yuri's night? I love being at NASA. This is very exciting for us. Uh, we, were, we pulled out a whole bunch of aerial objects for the occasion, and uh, we're excited about the audience response. And your group is called? Capacitor. I'm the artistic director. I'm Jody Lomask, and these are my lovely And are you excited about this evening? on the moon, yes! 6G! Well, we want to do a site-specific piece in zero gravity. <laughs> well, I'm with the Zero Gravity Arts Consortium and we do parabolic flights for artists. What, my, what, what would the lack of gravity do for your, a dance troupe like yourself? Well, what we specialize in is going into unique environments. One of the things we do is going into unusual and challenging environments and creating movement based on our physical experience in that environment. So we've done dance films and creative retreats in the forest in Costa Rica. And we've collaborated with astronomers on a whole evening show before. We've been working with researchers and scientists since 2000. So we're...
Celestine. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Busby, project manager for NASA Ames Research Center. And on behalf of our center director, Pete Warden, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming out this afternoon. We will hear from a few distinguished individuals, but before we do, I would like to acknowledge astronaut Buzz Aldrin of Apollo 11. Ms. Buzz, please stay with us. We also have other dignitaries with us, uh, including Steve Wozniak, and he'll, you'll be hearing from Steve, and Bo Bobko, uh, another astronaut who will be speaking. Right now, I ask that you stand as we post colors. May be seated. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the center director of Ames Research Center and the person who makes this event possible, Dr. S. P. Ward. Dr. Ward. Thank you. I really. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to welcome everybody here to this celebration, a celebration of uh, space and life and art and, and the future. And I, uh, uh, I chose to come as a Soviet general here today, uh, sort of in uh, honor of uh, what we're here for. Uh, for those of you that know me, I, I used to be a U.S. Brigadier General. I think this is a Soviet two-star general's outfit, so I took a promotion. But uh, really, it's a good opportunity to reflect on, on the past. Uh, and there's two events that uh, we're celebrating today. The first was Yuri Gagarin's flight in 1961. 
The second is the first space shuttle flight in 1981. This is the, the history, of the, both of these uh, uh, events is, and a lot of others in our early space programs were motivated more by competition. But we are now entering a fabulous new era, the next step uh, of mankind's development and eventual settlement of the solar system. Uh, this is with our, our uh, programs to go to the moon, Mars, and beyond. But the key thing that this celebration really brings home to us is that we are going as humanity. We're going together. We're going with all nations. And we're going to take with us not just the science and technology, which is so impressive here today, but the art, the society, uh, the, the music, the dancing, and the joy of being humans. So for the next 10, 12 hours, I really want to welcome everybody to, to the past, present, and the future. And the only other advice I could give to you is to party like it's 1961, 1981, or 2081. You take your pick. Thank you, Dr. Ward. In the celebration of human space flight, it is appropriate that we have comments from a person who has been there. I would like to introduce former astronaut, Bo Bobko. Bob was a pilot on the first Challenger mission, the commander of a Discovery mission, and commander of the first Atlantis mission. Bo, will you please join us and give us your views on yours night. Bo Bobko. Five years ago, I was standing in front of a group like this who were celebrating Yuri's night. The difference was that place was outside Zorakov, where Yuri had gone to school and where he landed after his first flight. You see, the Russians also realized that on the day when Yuri landed, that we had been propelled into a new age, the space age. And the Russians do like to celebrate. The Russians sent, remember, the Russians sent the first human into space and they are very proud of that fact. I was at Saratov as a member of the Association of Space Explorers. That group is compromised of astronauts and cosmonauts from 32 nations who have flown at least one orbit in space. Part of its chapter is it to an to promote environmental awareness. I don't believe you can look back at the Earth from space and not realize that it is fragile and needs to be protected. I recall one sunset on orbit when Don Peterson, a crew member, and I were looking out the window at the narrow band of atmosphere that's at above the limb of the Earth. Don said, you know, it's sobering to realize that 99.99% of all human activity and of all human history has taken place in that narrow band. Oleg Makarov, a Russian cosmonaut, said, anyone who has been in space knows that the patiently awaited unearthliness loses its charm quickly. It is not the boring uniform blackness of the, cosmic abyss, of the cosmic abyss that engages our attention, but the spectacle of, of our small planet haloed in blue. Suddenly, you get a feeling that you never had before, that you're an inhabitant of Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, for a long time to come, Earth is all we have. That is where we live. The Association of Space Explorers published a book of Earth photos. They called the book The Home Planet. I think that sums it up. Working with the Russians has been interesting. There's always been competition. They were the first to, first to put a human in orbit. We were the first to set foot on the moon. But now there is cooperation as well. As Pete mentioned, 
Together, we have built and operate the International Space Station, where joint American and Russian crews have worked in space for 2,718 days. We should be able to see the space station fly overhead tonight in about four hours. If we are going to be good stewards of our environment, we must work with the Russians and with many other nations. Our challenge is on a global scale. That challenge is great, but we are getting new understanding and capabilities to apply to the problem each day. We will not solve the problem of tomorrow with today's technologies. We must work to gain new knowledge and capabilities so the space age will be a great age for humanity. Let me close with a quote from Ed Mitchell, one of the Apollo astronauts. Suddenly, from behind the rim of the moon, in long, slow motion moments of immense majesty, there emerges a sparkling blue and white jewel, a light, delicate sky blue sphere laced with slowly swirling veils of white, rising gradually like a small pearl in a thick sea of black mystery. It takes more than a moment to realize this is Earth, home. Thank you and enjoy the Gary's night. Thank you, Bo. We will now have remarks from Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11. Buzz. Welcome to everybody here. Uh, I hope you appreciate the good Los Angeles weather that I brought you. I have my Versace uh, sunglasses here because I live pretty close to Beverly Hills, not in Beverly Hills. Uh, if I had known that Pete was going to wear that uh, Russian general's uniform, I'd have brought my jet fighter pilot helmet with me. <clears throat> there was a time when things were not quite so cozy uh, with the Soviet Union, and uh, that happened over in Korea. And I don't know whether one or two of the MiGs that I shot down was piloted by a Russian or not, but uh, they did get into the space age before us. But I'm a very proud American, and uh, on May 5th, not Less than a month from now, we're going to be celebrating Alan Shepard's first flight. Okay, all he could do is what Richard Branson is now trying to do with tourists that they want to call astronauts, and I don't quite agree with that either. I was very happy to have uh, participated, not, not just today, but yesterday, uh, at the opening of the Lunar Science Institute. I, I can see that Pete is trying to bring here to Ames things that are a little bit more current than what JPL and Caltech have there as they uh, go out to the farther reaches planets and Mars. Yeah, I want to see people go to Mars, there's no doubt about it. But I remember a quote that I made back in the early 80s when we were flying the shuttle, but we weren't too sure what we're going to do next. And I, and I uh, put together the phrase that the world's most desirable space station already has six American flags on it, and we should use it, and I think use it again. And I'm very happy to see a program, and I hope that the next administration uh, validates our program to return to the moon. And, and when we do, I'm sure that the overall sense that summarizes our future return will be symbolized as we go beyond one small step and magnificent desolation, and we realize that overall, the words on the plaque on the moon, we came in peace 
for all mankind characterizes America's efforts uh, in space. And uh, you have a wonderful leader here, whether he's a Soviet general or an American one star uh, or a center director, he's a number one innovator and thinker outside the box. And, and I feel proud to try and do that myself. So I congratulate uh, your center director and all of you for coming out here today uh, and have a ball. But let's also have an Owl's Night. And remember JFK said something on the 25th of May, we do things, now that was a later speech, but anyway, he did say, we do things be, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. So think about that. Don't just take the easy way, but here at Ames, and uh, think about Yuri's night. Uh, the world does entertain doing things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Thank you. Thank you, Buzz. We will now have remarks by Steve Weisnack. Steve. Oh, what an honor it is to address you here. I was born in San Jose. I was raised in Sunnyvale. So, of course, this entire area of Moffett Field has been a very big part of my life forever. And, um, you know, NASA, it, you know, the inspirations, the achievements of NASA are what inspired us to want to study technology and get good at it because we could be one of those people that changed the world. And we all came up with these ideals in our lives before we thought about, oh, this is a way to make a lot of money or anything. And uh, so I, and I admire NASA so much. This event it is, I mean, you've really got to admire NASA for being able to allow something like this here. We're bringing in a lot of the outside populace with the NASA community itself, and we're really spreading the word. You know, this is a new life. You know, NASA, it's not the end of something, it's the beginning of something. NASA's gonna go through transitions and changes. Look at all the great technologies we got in our lives. Would we have personal computers, or would they be up to this position and date if we hadn't had things like NASA, requirements of the military, people who have a lot of need for a lot of money to research new technologies before they're affordable for the masses, lead to those things being parts of our life later on. The theme of today's event, renewable energy. Who the heck, when I think of how NASA sent spaceships to the moon and back, you know, for weeks with, with uh, you know, the entire life support systems and keeps everyone alive and the sort of technology, and how do they, the incredible battery systems they have, the uses of energy, you know, that are so much a part of our future really come a lot from the space effort. That's what we discovered. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Yuri started it all, and uh, go Yuri. Thank you, Steve. I would like to acknowledge uh, Ms. Shanna Dale, Deputy Administrator of NASA. Ms. Dale. We will now have the uh, final remarks followed by a ribbon cutting, and to deliver the final remarks will be the mayor of Sunnyville, Tony Spinnerary. Good afternoon. Wow. <laughs> First, I want to thank Director Warden for such a, a great day and a great partnership and a great neighbor to the city of Sunnyville. And I was thinking back here, what a great honor it is to stand on the stage with, with folks who, who took uh, a great step for us in going out of space. And I don't know how many remember, but I remember as a young boy in New York, I remember when that Sputnik went over New York City. And I'm thinking, I hope I'm not really that old. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it's a great day. And, and the most important thing is, is the great uh, community of NASA and its relationship with its surrounding communities and with Sunnyville and the things that they do to inform our community on what they're doing and where they're going to make sure that they continue to be a great neighbor. And we are appreciative of that. And uh, we hope to have a long, long relationship and working cooperative and making sure that the things that NASA does out here has a great impact on not only the world, but our local communities. And I'll know they do that. And I won't stay up here much longer, but other than say congratulations on the first uh, space uh, 
flight with uh, Sputnik and to be on the stage with uh, uh, Yvonne uh, Claiborne and Buzz Allward and the command of the shuttle is just a tremendous honor. So thank you and I hope you have a great day and enjoy the rest of the evening of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, after these uh, ceremonies, we will uh, have one of our astronauts, Dr. Yvonne Cago, sign autographs. So uh, please make sure that you visit Dr. Cago. She's an astronaut, currently the U.S. Air Force, and medical doctor. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Cago. Dr. Cago. Good afternoon all, I'm a homegrown, educated Northern California girl, so thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. All right, well, on behalf of the NASA crew office, to all of our gravity-bound colleagues, we thank you for participating in this wonderful celebration. One day we are going to take this celebration from the Earth to the cosmos, where the streets will be sprinkled with moon dust and populated by stargazers such as yourselves. So, in salute and honor to our next generation of new space travelers, Ad Astra. Thank you.
Yeah. 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 And then we went straight up and just stopped and then started well, coming down. Wait until this one takes Oh, they're not doing that one. Yeah. No, they're not. They did them yesterday. They're going to do them. I don't think so. It's all, it's all set up. They're going to have other ones, I think, from over there. Are you going to take that? Do you have any tape left? How many tapes do you have left? Two? Here he comes. Yeah, I got enough. It's, it's, okay, it's hard yeah. to tape. So when you tape oh, yeah. it, it doesn't look like No, you <laughs> save most of it for yeah. tonight. Yeah. Where is it? Where is it? God, it's hard to film. Now 
we're setting up for some slow flight. Slow flights where we're actually dangling right on the edge of control flight envelope. All control surfaces and throttle work. Keep the airplane airborne and control of this. Yeah, at the very, very edge of the envelope. Going downhill, get some airspeed. Jimmy that control. Set up for a tower spin. Vertical step. Oh, no. See if we can get this tall for us. Very nice. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to present to you the smallest loop ever. This is what we call the micro loop. Let's see how small you can get it today. Here it goes the throttle a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> the small loop. And in this book, Living Aloft, it speaks about the psychological, the sociological, the physiological aspects relative to keeping our species alive and flourishing as we move into space. Um, as an artist, I've always tried to work with psychologists to create a, a, a bridge between their work and uh, the possible benefits that creative activities could have for long-term space missions. Can artistic activities help reduce stress, decrease boredom, build stronger relationships between space crews that are made up of people from all over the world? Now, at the same time, as an American, I have one cultural point of view relative to these possibilities, as well as uh, our colleague here from, uh, from Japan, Ayoko Ono, who's going to talk a little bit about her perspective and her work with the Japanese Space Agency and the European Space Agency relative to these potential possibilities in space. Ayoko, let's give her a hand. I wanted to improve the environment because it's very small and um, the smell is not good and too many things is inside and noisy place. So I proposed several ideas and also I could experience the ESA parabolic flight. Also, as a student, I applied for JAXA student parabolic flight. So 
today I will show some well all all the experiment artistic experiment uh, cooperated with European Space Agency. Also, I will introduce a metallic metallic sculptor, Japanese metallic sculptor, who is collaborating me, and he also used the European Space Agency's drop tower for the sculpture in weightlessness. So please come here to see the video works at 11.30 p.m. Thank you. We can only imagine and wonder what our world will be like as a species we travel off planet. But also at the same time, as we honor the Earth and we honor what's going on within the uh, space exploration industry, that we not forget about the animals that have gone into space. Pan, the uh, chimpanzee that went into space prior to uh, the uh, human space flight, uh, was really significant and important. So later on this evening, we'll be seeing uh, videos that relate to him. Uh, we also have a variety of projects from Japan, uh, uh, Ishiguro Setsuka, uh, of paintings that were done uh, on uh, the Silk Road uh, many, many, many thousands of years ago. And she's worked with the Japanese Space Agency and she's made it real to envision the fact that these deities floated in zero gravity. She'll be showing video later on of these deities floating in zero gravity. We also have Lowry Burgess from Carnegie Mellon University. The place of the muses, you know, all the arts on the moon. And it's the first historic project that's happened that's an arts, science, culture, and space science collaboration where we'll actually this evening have a message from the astronauts on the International Space Station all the participants at Yuri's Night at 8.30. I see the Earth and the Earth is beautiful were the first words that Yuri Gagarin spoke when he was uh, in space. In 1961, when he went on his first space flight, he looked out the window and he looked back down to planet Earth and he saw the Earth and he saw the Earth was beautiful. And uh, the video transitions that we'll have this evening at 8.30 will um, honor that work and the celebration that was created uh, uh, here this evening that uh, whose theme is radical technology for a I uh, am the co-founder and project director for the Zero Gravity Arts Consortium, and we advocate for artistic access to spaceflight technology. I've had the pleasure to work with the uh, NASA Johnson Space Center and NASA's Student Reduced Gravity Flight Program, and in 1998, I was uh, offered an opportunity to go into weightlessness. And as a painter, I took pastry bags and floated in zero gravity and projected the paint out into the space surrounding my body, appropriating what Jackson Pollock did, but eliminating the canvas, eliminating the structure, and using microgravity as a way of contributing to the compositional development of the paintings. Those projects will be shown later on. Ideas, what new possibilities might come of a communication technology that happens among people floating in space as we travel off to Mars and to the outer planets over many, many year duration. What are these people going to do as we move into space? Now, part of this event this evening is uh, the whole concept of the Festival of Ideas. And we hope you all begin to engage one another in talking about the various questions that relate to space culture and the activities that we're all engaged in in our daily lives. But imagine what it might be like for the plumber, for the dancer, for the, the electrician, for everyone to go into space. In the next hundred years, that will become a greater reality for each of us. So what potential does that hold for us? Now that we're at the point in which we're beginning to embark off planet Earth, what do we want to take with us as we move into space? Do we want to take our culture, our sciences, dance, theater, poetry? What should go with us? We have very important questions to ask, ask ourselves as we move off planet. I think as you move around the exhibitions this evening, as you see the performances, as you greet and meet up with other people, 
be open to discussing these possibilities. Talk to one another about the economics of space, the social relations in space, all of these different aspects related to our species moving off planet and traveling to the moon, to Mars, and to other parts of our solar system. Dean screen, again, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, arts, music, all of them should go to space because we need to go as a fully integrated being. We can't just use one part of our brain. We need to use our heart, our soul, and our intuition. to the steam screen. We uh, have changed the acronym STEM, which is used within the sciences, to really help focus funding on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And as you can see the steam pipes up above the steam screen, we decided to change the acronym. And as a matter of fact, it was Marge Myers, our first uh, virtual world presenter today, this afternoon, that decided to coin a new acronym. And she decided to use the idea of STEAM instead of STEM and extend STEM to include the words art and music. So STEAM stands for science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, and music. Right now, there's someone in our audience who represents an organization that is uh, definitively representative of the combination and balance of arts, science, and technology. Leonardo Magazine has been around for many years, and it's a publication of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I'd like to introduce Beverly Reiser, who's with Leonardo Magazine, to tell us a little bit about this organization and its programs. It's had many effects and impact on organizations and activities throughout the world and we're going to have Beverly now tell us a little bit about Leonardo and the incredible activities that this organization is involved with. Let's give Beverly a hand. Well first of all in 1968 there was a, a rocket scientist and a co-founder of who was living in Paris as an artist. And he looked around and he realized that there was no um, means for artists to talk to each other. That is, artists who were on working with science and new technologies. Uh, there, there was no means for them to talk to each other about their work. So he founded a journal called the Leonardo. And um, it's a peer-reviewed journal. And this was 40 years ago. And now
together now. It is at one moment when we become unified. We've come here to honor Yuri Gagarin, first human in space for our human race. Let us take the journey and continue looking into the heavens and down upon the earth. One world without borders, one nation, one peoples. Let's take the journey and go.
to find a reusable spacecraft. Of course, the space shuttle. We'll witness Yuri's night celebration from 200 miles above the Earth, where we marvel every day at how precious our home planet is. In fact, the first words spoken from space were, I see the Earth, it is beautiful. Those words were spoken in Russian by Yuri Gagarin, but space travelers have echoed them many times since and in many languages. The International Space Station is a testament to worldwide cooperation and incredible technology that is shaping our future, an ongoing celebration of space exploration. Enjoy your evening.
habits, the journey and the message. For those of you that weren't aware, we were having a little technical difficulty, which often happens. But truly understand that this is and was a message directly from the International Space Station. And we want to thank Carnegie Mellon, Professor Lowry, who, went along with Frank Pietro Negro and their colleagues, pushed to have this brought to you at NASA. We want to thank all the dignitaries of NASA that helped to bring this through, along with myself, Golden Star Productions, and doing the visuals, and Space Generation Council. We want to thank you all for taking this journey, and we hope that it had some meaning for you as the beginning of culture in space, because we are going, and it is you that makes a difference. sustainable radical technology for sustainable future so it's it's also the first time that we've really tried to bring greening energies into uh, events for NASA so I just want you to be aware of that and um, for our next speaker we have Jonathan Trent who is a very own NASA Ames astrobiologist so I asked him what are you going to talk about and he said the cosmic context, past, present, and future of sustainability on Earth. Let's give a hand. when he was 27 years old. Amazing to think of. Listen, I want to talk to you about the cosmic context. And what I mean by that is I want to go through where we are. I want to talk to you also about the past, present, and future of sustainability. I want to talk about what sustainability is and how we can relate to sustainability. So we live in a Milky Way galaxy, and that galaxy we can visualize from various places on Earth. And as we look at the Milky Way galaxy, we can, we can move it around and we can orient ourselves within the billion stars that are represented here. We can also model what the galaxy looks like, and we know where we are in that galaxy. We are off to one corner within a billion stars. So when we think about the galaxy, we think about stars. And you know, we've come far enough in our understanding to realize how stars actually form. Stars are these incredible anomalies in space, a gravitational anomaly where hydrogen and helium are forming a, a, a gravitational well in which this massive fusion reactor starts this process called a star. We're visualizing here the process for star formation. And these are some examples of stars that I think are really instructive. So for example, the star that you see on the right, Antares, is called a super red giant. 
And if you look at this star, it's 700 light years away from the Earth, and yet it's one of the brightest stars in our night sky. It's 65,000 times brighter than, uh, than our sun. And if you, if you notice this star, Octaris, you can see um, a star that's about the, the third or fourth brightest in our night sky. And down here to the left, you can see the sun. Right there, that small star is the sun. So there's Octaris, and there's our sun. So the process of planet formation involves the process of a disk, usually, in which the dust particles in, in space are gathered together to form planets. And what you're seeing here, the actual formation of a, a model of how our solar system formed. So you see the tiny planets revolving around our sun. So here is the sun, and here you see the planets. And our sun represents 99.8% of the mass in our solar system. And you can see that speck there is the Earth. And the Earth here is shown next to the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, which are made up mostly of hydrogen and helium, are planets that if you were to try to land on them, you would actually just sort of ooze your way deeper and deeper into their atmospheres. You can see Uranus and Neptune, both of which are rocky, uh, icy, uh, large planets in the outer solar system. And the rocky planets in the front row are the ones we're going to talk about. The Earth, Venus, Mars, and Mercury. Now, of course, if you think about these planets, you immediately notice that the Earth has got water on it, and all the others are pretty much devoid of water. It's very likely that Venus may have had an ocean on it in its early history, but that ocean has long since been destroyed. Mars still has some water on it, but it's far away, and that water is very, very cold. But I want to talk to you about the Earth. I mean, the Earth is really the planet that we are focused on, both in terms of where we are, and but also in terms of um, how we're going to sustain life on this planet. The atmosphere um, and the oceans on the Earth formed in its early history. Most of the water came to the planet, at least half of it came to the planet from, the, from comets and asteroids which brought water from the outer solar system. Also, the water formed from outgas and steam from the inside of the planet. There have been a number of atmospheres on our planet in the planet's history. At least five atmospheres have existed on the planet. And the early planet had an atmosphere of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, um, ammonia, nitrogen gas, and almost no oxygen, less than 2% oxygen. The more important thing that I'd like to convey to you is the timeline. And how to visualize time. Time is a difficult concept, so let's imagine the Earth's history on a football field. We can relate to a football field, right? The whole of the Earth's history is 4.5 billion years old. And so if 100 yards is a 4.5 billion years, we can then ask, where's, where's life's timeline on this? Well, life, life arose on the 25-yard line. 3.5 billion years ago, we have good evidence of life. That evidence we still find on Earth, it's called stromatolites. These are small organisms that form a kind of structure that we can see, because it forms a rock-like structure, and we can date these things, and we know what they look like. So, the most amazing thing, or the most important thing that these organisms did is they changed the atmosphere of the Earth rather substantially. They put oxygen into the atmosphere, huge amounts of oxygen relative to what was here before. So the, um, the organisms that you see from the 35-yard line and then the plants that arose on the 45-yard on the line are responsible for changing the atmosphere so that it has now the 21% oxygen that's so important for all the rest of life. But let's continue this timeline, and let's start putting organisms onto this football field. On the 30-yard line, we have the first example of a multicellular organism. Before that, everything was microscopic and very, very small. 
On the 15 yard line, we have jellyfish 700 million years ago. All the life forms that we're familiar with occurred in the last 10 yards of our football field, so called Cambrian explosion, 600 million years of complex life. Land plants occurred on the nine yard line, insects and amphibians about the seven yard line. We have dinosaurs and mammals happening on the five yard line. The dinosaurs disappear on the one yard line. We have flowering plants on the two yard line. Before that, there were no flowers on the earth. And what about us? The earliest mammals that are like us go back about three million years. That puts them about three inches from the goal. Australopithecine Africanus, it's called. And, and animals like us, 0 0.8 inches from the goal. So we are relatively recent happening on the Earth. Human beings have been here for a tiny fraction of the Earth's history. Before that, before the last 10 yards, the whole first 90 yards, where life existed was all microscopic life forms. The other thing to keep in mind is that we think of planet Earth and we do a, we do a cross section of planet Earth, the biosphere, the part where there's life, is, is barely visible as a tiny, tiny film on the surface of the planet.